Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Parul Chandra and with me today is Tenzin Dawa. Tenzin is a researcher with the Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy, which is based in Dharamsala in the state of Himachal Pradesh. Tenzin has been looking at uh, uh, the, the human rights violations in Tibet during her research with the center and uh, she's here to talk about it with us on Strat News Global. Welcome to Strat News Global, Tenzin. Thank you. Thank you, Paro, for having me on your show. Uh, let me begin by asking you first, can you give us a brief overview of human rights violations by the Chinese authorities in Tibet? Right. So uh, ever since the invasion of Tibet by the Chinese government in 1959, you know, there have been the Chinese government have been actively implementing numerous uh, assimilationist and repressive policies in Tibet. And under these you know, policies, Tibetans are specifically targeted for their very identity and culture. And thereby, it makes it very difficult for the Tibetans inside Tibet to live a life of dignity. And uh, over the past you know, more than six decades, under the oppression of the Chinese government, you know, there is persistent political repression, uh, marginalization of economic, cultural assimilation, uh, environmental destruction, and social discriminations in Tibet. Now, you spoke about the culture and identity of Tibetans, which is under attack or which is being persecuted, persecuted by the Chinese in the, in, in the Tibet uh, autonomous region. Uh, how, how are they going about repressing Tibetans in this area? You know, uh, you know, for many years, uh, the Chinese government has been, you know, uh, implementing these various ag uh, aggressive policies of, for example, you know, I give an example of the bilingual education policy in Tibet. So under this policy, what the Chinese government is basically doing is to uh, aggressively promote Mandarin language as the main medium of instruction in Tibetan schools. And in, uh, you know, that marginalizes the Tibetan language at the same time. So in 2019 alone, you know, we saw that uh, the Chinese government has issued local directives in many uh, rural townships in the Tibet autonomous region, asking them to, uh, you know, switch to using Mandarin as the main medium of instructions. Now, this is, uh, we see this as a systematic approach from the side of the Chinese government to, you know, uh, forcibly estrange Tibetan children and Tibetan uh, Tibetans in future to, you know, forcibly estrange them from the very survival of Tibetan culture and language in the many years to come. So, and also at the same time, you know, nowadays we're seeing this trend of this uh, Chinese government, you know, issuing a lot of local directives that mm -hmm. involves uh, directing Tibetan parents of children to, you know, uh, hold them responsible for, uh, sending uh, responsible was responsible for sending them to uh, attend religious festivals during the school children's uh, children's you know school uh, holidays so as to uh, sort of uh, separate them from the Tibetan really identity and culture which is deeply also uh, uh, you know and rooted in the Tibetan religion you know so seeing the systematic approaches by the Chinese government uh, in many Tibetan areas you mentioned how they're trying to put curbs on uh, the observance of say tibetan festivals religious festivals uh, now there are also reports of how the chinese are trying to curtail um, uh, tibet the tibetan religion mm -hmm. and uh, in in the region and in fact there are reports of the sinicization of tibetan buddhism now how are they going about this can you shed some light on this Sure. So uh, this the sinicization of Tibetan Buddhism was, you know, this plan was formally approved at the 19th Standing Committee meeting of the Buddhist Association of China in July last year in Beijing. So under this plan, you know, it requires all Tibetan Buddhist practitioners to prioritize the uh, promotion and implementation of party policies on uh, religion in order to, you know, make religions Chinese. And so the sinicization of this Tibetan Buddhism is basically an effort from the side of the Chinese government to shape Tibetan Buddhism to uh, party's dictates. So whatever the government says, Tibetan Buddhists, you know, have to obey to that. And uh, 
you know, this, uh, you know, this, uh, the synthesization of this Buddhist uh, Buddhism includes uh, stricter control over monastic uh, recruitment uh, and setting up uh, patriotic education classes in Buddhist colleges and other institutions. And also, you know, this uh, synthesization not only targets the trappings of religious practice, but it, also, uh, it is also an intrusion of into, you know, people's inner lives by a repressive government. So, uh, so at the same time, you know, uh, uh, these are uh, at the same time, you know, uh, under this campaign, they are sending a lot of uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist practitioners into political indoctrination campaigns. And these campaigns have intensified, especially under Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. and, uh, these campaigns are, you know, religiously blasphemous in nature and uh, inherently uh, you know, coercive. Where, you know, where monks and nuns are punished for exercising their beliefs and for following their conscience, basically. And they have left no option but to denounce their spiritual leader, uh, including the Dalai Lama and other revered Tibetan Buddhist Lamas. So monks and nuns and many Tibetans uh, during these indoctrination campaigns have to, you know, denounce their uh, religious leaders. And uh, they are made to sing, you know, patriotic songs, you know, which basically states love the motherland and the party states and things like that. So these indoctrination campaigns are, you know, are carried out and conducted on a, you know, very mass scale in every village in Tibet. If I may ask a follow up question to this, uh, these, uh, these are indoctrination campaigns, you said, right? Uh, now, are these on the lines of, say, the re-education re camps or the vocational training centers that the Chinese have in the Xinjiang province? And uh, uh, because they seem to be very coercive in nature, uh, you can ask, uh, say, the Tibetan monks and nuns to repeat the Communist Party slogans, etc. But what after that? I mean, do they really adhere to these kinds of this kind of brainwashing by the Chinese? Well, not really. They are, you know, basically imposed and coerced to send uh, to be into this indoctrination campaigns but if you really look into the uh, people of ethnic minorities specifically the tibetans and the Uyghurs, you know you see that it's impossible to you know quite impossible to change their beliefs and especially if you look into this uh, uh ethnic auto, uh, ethnic unity law that was passed yes. in, this year in may yes. this year, you know it's quite evident that chinese government has you know over the last uh, six, more than six decades, their occupation uh, during the occupation of Tibet, they have quite failed to, you know, win the hearts and minds of the Tibetan people, and hence, you know, they're having to implement these uh, regulations so as to, you know, really impose these sort of uh, regulations on the Tibetans and other ethnic minorities. So I don't think uh, they are really able to win, really win the hearts and minds of Tibetans, but. Uh, they are the Chinese government are you know trying their best uh, for many years uh, to sort of uh, coerce them into denouncing their religious and cultural beliefs. Uh, now, can you share with us some some thoughts on what are they doing to the monasteries in Tibet? So basically, uh, in the last many years, you know, we're seeing a complete uh, desecration of Tibetan monasteries in Tibet. You know. Specifically, if you look in the year 2016, the Chinese government ha, you know, started demolishing one of the largest Buddhist institutes in Tibet, which is the Larungar, uh, where you know, many Tibetan Buddhist practitioners and Buddhist practitioners across the world come there to practice religion and study Buddhist, Buddhism there. So in 2016, we see this whole demolition of all these monasteries and uh, monastic institutions at the institute. And, uh, you know, they, you know, the Chinese government, they claim that they are trying to better manage this institution, but at the same time, what they're doing is they're destroying the very root of, really root of the Tibetan uh, Buddhism center there. And, uh, you know, they, thereby sending all these monks and nuns who are studying there to political indoctrination campaigns again, to denounce, mm -hmm. sort of denounce uh, their beliefs, political beliefs and religious beliefs and all, all of that in the in this campaign. So uh, you mentioned this ethnic unity law that the Chinese have brought in this year and they started implementing it uh, from May 1st this year. In fact, uh, what are they trying to do with this law? I've also read reports that they are also encouraging 
uh, Tibetans to marry the Han Chinese. Uh, are these such reports correct? Well, uh, this is not explicitly said in the law, but that's mm -hmm. one of the intentions, you know. So basically, uh, in, uh, and this is a really concerning issue for us because this regulation uh, gives the Chinese authority, the complete, uh, you know, Chinese government, the complete authority to enforce a uh, uh, Chinese centric way of life for Tibetans. And this will, you know, further exacerbate the already discriminatory treatment of Tibetans inside Tibet. Because, you know, under this regulation, you know, it requires equal participation of all non-Tibetan ethnic uh, groups at all levels, including at government levels, at school levels, at private companies, or even at religious centers, you know. So, at, uh, and, and many, and, uh, you know, under this regulation, many, as you said, you know, Han Chinese are being migrated into Tibet. Yes. And this will, you know, further decimate the already uh, grim state of local culture there. So, yes. and if you really look at it, it's, it's strange because you can't really force someone to adopt a culture. I mean, it's a way of life, right? So, yes. and Tibetans must be able to practice their own culture and identity on their own. So, yeah. Do you have any estimate of uh, the migration that is going on by the Han Chinese into TAR? Uh, I know it's very difficult to get any kind of information from uh, uh, Tibet, but do you have any kind of estimates, any numbers on, 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 these, on these migrations? Well, uh, you know, we don't really have statistics because, yes. as, first of all, information, getting information nowadays is very difficult and very challenging mm -hmm. as, as researchers, you know, specifically with all these bans on uh, communication apps like WeChat and all. So it's very difficult for us to ascertain this uh, reliable information and numbers from Tibet. And also at the same time, uh, government statistics are nothing to, nothing at all, not at all, you know, reliable. So we don't really refer to these statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let me take you on to another topic and which is about arbitrary arrests and detentions of Tibetans, Tibetan activists, again, Tibetan monks and nuns. And uh, uh, when I heard you speak recently, you also mentioned the fact that uh, these, the people who are detained really have no access to any kind of legal help. And even if they do, the Chinese lawyers who take the risk of defending them in turn face, uh, uh, they, they, they in turn are targeted by the Chinese authorities. So can you share your thoughts on this with us? Sure. So, you know, uh, Tibetans inside Tibet are routinely persecuted to, you know, lengthy prison terms or for simply uh, keeping contacts with outsiders. Mm -hmm. It could be Tibetan living outside in exile, right? And, uh, and also sharing information on, on Tibet to outsiders. So they are persecuted uh, and convicted on, you know, very vague and overbroad charges of inciting separatism or leaking state secrets or endangering state uh, stability. So all of these very broad charges, you know, mm -hmm. Chinese government have no clear definition of what really constitutes as uh, something as illegal or something as separatist. So, you know, under these charges, once, you know, their Tibetans are arrested, uh, they are, you know, subjected to very long periods of detention, of incommunicado detention, for instance, because Tibetan, seventy-five percent of Tibetan detainees inside Tibet are their family members are not informed of their whereabouts, you know, and their incommunicado detention gets uh, expanded broadly because there is a lack of complete lack of institutional oversight in China, and uh, as you said, as I as you as you mentioned before, you know. Uh, it's very difficult to ensure a fair trial in uh, China, for instance, because Chinese, mm -hmm. China doesn't have an independent judiciary. The trials are just a formality and all the verdicts have already been decided. And Tibetan detainees, you know, they do not get a right to hire legal defense of the choice. And even mm -hmm. if they manage to find one, uh, the, law the lawyers themselves are subjected to harassment, intimidations and threats, and even revocation of their lawyer's license. And, you know, uh, We've done interviews with several Chinese lawyers who have an experience of defending Tibetan cases. And they, you know, shared with us challenges, the kind of challenges they face, you know, when dealing with Tibetan political detainees. They say that uh, de uh, dealing with the case of Tibetan political prisoners are usually looked at as a very sensitive uh, and are often politicized. Mm -hmm. So 
difficult to ensure a fair trial for Tibetan detainees in the Chinese judiciary. Tenzin, uh, one question uh, again pertaining to the intense surveillance that Tibetans are put under in in Tibet. And this is about the grid system that the Chinese have enforced. What exactly is it? So, you know, the, uh, the Chinese authorities are using very uh, targeted surveillance tactics to violate the rights of freedom of expression and privacy of ordinary Tibetans or even journalists or bloggers inside Tibet or even human, human rights defenders in Tibet, you know. So there is a widespread use of surveillance tactics aimed at, you know, crushing down on any forms of dissent and silencing human rights informants in Tibet, both online and offline. So offline, like you mentioned, you know, we have the systematic obedience system campaigns like the grid management systems and mm -hmm. the village-based cargo systems. So under these systems, what, they, the, what the Chinese government is basically doing is that they're dividing Tibetan towns into, you know, grids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are, they've installed, they've stationed, you know, police checkpoints on all these neighborhoods. And the Chinese government have, you know, stationed, at the same time, they have stationed thousands of cadre members in these Tibetan areas to act as informants, you know, to act as informants, to monitor Tibetan life. And uh, thereby, you know, it leaves very difficult for Tibetans to freely express in such environment. And at the same time, you know, we, we, have, we have heard from many Tibetans inside Tibet that they are now losing trust upon each other, even in the neighborhoods. And therefore, they ha they're having to self-censor themselves. You know, so because if they speak something today, tomorrow, you know, someone might uh, inform the government authorities and they, then they get persecuted for just expressing that. So under all these systems, you know, Tibetans are living in a very uh, precarious situation. Inside now, you have said that uh, the international community should hold China to account on these laws and uh, ensure that it adheres to it. But how can the international community do this? Uh, so, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you know, China is a state party to numerous international human rights treaties and governance. Yes. You know, and they cannot just do whatever they wish on uh, based on whatever and however they wish, you know. So, for instance, China has signed and ratified six core uh, international human rights treaties, including uh, the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Violence. We have the Convention Against Torture, Convention mm -hmm. Against the Child, and Enforced Disappearance. So all these major conventions they have signed and ratified. And now, since they are a party to these conventions, you know, they have a, a legal obligation to uh, respect, protect, and fulfill these provisions under these treaties in good faith. So mm -hmm. therefore, you know, states as a member of the international community, you know, can look into international mechanisms that oversee the functioning of these conventions, including the committees of uh, elimination, Committee on Elimination of uh, Racial Discrimination or Committee on CEDA or Committee on Act, uh, on CATS. So all these committees, you know, the states can look into it and make formal complaints of the Chinese disobeyance of these uh, conventions, right? So at the same time, you know, states can also adopt uh, consequential rights related sanctions like the US global mechanism uh, style sanctions, you know, which are specifically uh, designed to impose consequences uh, for rights violations, including visa bans and freeze of assets uh, for, you know, perpetrators of human rights violations. Mm -hmm. So states can adopt similar uh, sanctions like this in their legislation. And at the same time, you know, states can also cumulatively exert pressure on China to allow, you know, independent fact-finding missions like Tibet. Because uh, for, um, for many decades, China has not allowed individual experts yes. of civil and political rights to visit Tibet and to you know, report information on the ground. You know, over the past years, Chinese, Chinese government have allowed economic experts, but not mm -hmm. civil political experts. So states can, you know, uh, cumulatively exert pressure on China to allow these exports to to see the real situation there, you know, so as to and to debunk all these propaganda and government narratives as they always came to, you know, that Tibet yes. is a happy life, there is economic development in place, so it's, whether it's really there or not, it's, I think it's, uh, it's incumbent upon all the states to, you know, pressure China. And lastly, you know, uh, states, you know, uh, uh, states can also ensure that uh, uh, that they, you know, that the uh, 
or sort of the operations, economic operations, are are not in complicit with uh, the uh, the human rights violations that the Chinese government is uh, carrying out in uh, Tibet and other ethnic minority areas. So all of these measures, you know, states as a member of international community can take and you know pressure China. You mentioned the international treaties and obligations. Uh, at the same time, you know, you have the UN Human Rights Council, which mm -hmm. takes note of uh, human rights violations by various states, countries. Do you feel that the UN HRC has let the Tibetan people down? Um, you know, uh, over the last many years, you know, mm -hmm. there are various mechanisms under Human Rights Council that uh, sort of uh, brings forward specific cases of human rights violations, such as the independent experts and the special rapporteurs and the working yes. groups that uh, work under this Human Rights Council, right? So uh, as Tibetan human rights defendant, you know, we regularly submit our uh, cases of Tibetan political prisoners, you know, deteriorating situation of human rights inside Tibet. They, uh, they are, you know, they are actually trying their best to exert pressure and communicate with China on these uh, human rights violations. But we see that, you know, the Chinese government since it enjoys a, you know, really uh, large economic clout in yes. the region itself. Yes. They are sort of trying to silence all of these voices mm -hmm. in the region itself. So there's these challenges there, but we yeah. see that the individual experts and the independent experts, they're trying their best to, you know, communicate with the Chinese government. Mm. On that note, uh, Tenzin, thank you so much for sharing uh, your views on uh, human rights violations in Tibet. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.